Now, um, another really very, very interesting point that I find is that the entire scene is encircled by a serpent, by a snake. This is the head of the snake and it goes all the way around and his tail is almost being swallowed. Now, the, the, the snake, um, you know, in a lot of books, I collect a hell of a lot of books. Um, mostly, the snake is considered as a symbol of wisdom in the ancient era. Uh, and so I, I did some reading and research into how this notion of the snake representing wisdom and knowledge in the ancient world came about. And my research really led me to, um, you know, make this film in a way because what I found is that it wasn't actually snakes that were venerated as being intelligent. It was the reptilian aspect to their being that was associated with reptilian or serpent-like creatures in the legendary histories of planet Earth, characters like Quetzalcoatl in Mexico that brought the civilizations of uh, Central and South America, you know, fantastic knowledge about the stars, and other reptilian beings, uh, such as Nu Kua, which was a reptilian goddess in ancient China, it was this notion that these reptilian beings that came from the stars, full of knowledge, genetics and science, which then was oversimplified and throughout history came down to the point where the snake represents wisdom of the ancient world. Genesis 3, this is the fall passage. Let's take a look at it as a backdrop to Genesis 6. And we all know the story, and Dave has, has sort of provided a nice segue here. We have something called the serpent, or the snake, uh, with Eve in the Garden of Eden, where they have a conversation. And the serpent, the snake, gets her to eat of the forbidden fruit and introduces rebellion, sin into the world. Of course, Adam is the one who gets ultimately blamed for it because, uh, as Paul says, he sinned knowingly, whereas Eve was deceived. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman replied, The serpent, the Hebrew is Hanakash, the H with a dot under it is the technically proper Hebrew transliteration right here. CH with the K sound like Loch Ness. The Nakash duped me and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the Nakash, 
Because you did this, more cursed shall you be than all cattle and all the wild beasts. On your belly shall you crawl, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, which just means hatred or some adversarial relationship, between you and the woman, and between your offspring, literally it says your seed, and her offspring, again, literally seed. Let's start in with Nakash here and elaborate on each of those and explain them a little better. What does Nakash mean? It's a very common root. Three letters in Hebrew, the N, so the Nun, the Ket, and the Shin, Nakash, which functions as three things, a noun, a verb, or an adjective in the Hebrew Bible. Now the question is here, how should we understand it? Because if it's a noun, it has one meaning. If it's a verb, it has a different meaning. And an adjective is actually a third meaning. So if we're looking here, if we take nakash in its normal noun meaning, the word would mean it's serpent. Entirely possible. But I've already told you I don't think that's what it is. If you take it as its verb meaning, the verb nakash means to deceive or to divine. That means the practice of divination. Uh, don't need to elaborate on that. So if, if you take it in its verbal sense, you would translate this as the deceiver or the diviner. Yeah. That, that can work, of course. If you take it as the normal adjective meaning, nakash is something that shines. It's a shiny thing. And you could translate this term as the shining one. Now that's going to become important later on. I won't elaborate on it in here. But there are two other passages, <coughs> namely Ezekiel, excuse me. <coughs> namely Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 that also discuss the incident in the garden. And in both of those you have a shining and also, I will argue, serpentine being. I think actually all three meanings are at play. This is a triple entendre essentially. I think that the Nakash is essentially a serpentine, luminous being. I take it in its adjectival sense, the shining one. Again, a brilliant, shining, angelic, or divine being is cast out of Eden. Neither of those, these passages right here describe a snake. If you go here and here, you're going to talk about a shining being. In fact, we get our word Lucifer from Isaiah 14, where it says the, the being who is thrown out is actually named. His name in Hebrew is Halel ben Shachar, which simply means the shining one, the sun of the dawn. And so you have this association. There are creatures living in outer space. And I'm, I'm the first one to realize how crazy that sounds. Um, scientists would immediately say, well, that's impossible. There's ultraviolet radiation in space. Uh, without having a craft around you, you'll die. Well, all I can say is that these, I call them space serpents, um, they do exist. They've been filmed by Story Musgrave, who's a senior space shuttle commander. He's been with NASA for 30 years. He's seen one of these space serpents on two occasions. He's filmed it on one occasion.
They've also been filmed from the ground, flying around in the upper atmosphere. Now, quite frankly, we don't know anything about the life cycle of these creatures, but they do fit in with the descriptions of other kinds of critters, other strange looking creatures that astronauts from the very early days of NASA have reported. Um, I suspect that they use some form of photosynthesis and I suspect that um, they hydrate themselves by flying in the upper atmosphere of planets. One important thing I must say though about these space serpents is that there are about seven or eight very very important uh, ancient sites, temple sites uh, on planet Earth, most notably in Mexico. And these temples are dedicated to the memory of flying serpents. And this is what we see in this footage, is flying serpents. There also seems to be a very interesting relationship between the flying serpent and these small luminous spheres. Houston, we are using the payload bay cameras right now to hopefully catch a glimpse of the Russian space station Mir as it performs an on-orbit burn. Though it will be difficult to uh, pick Mir out from the stars as they pass behind us, the uh, payload bay cameras are positioned such that they're looking straight back, back, straight back behind the orbiter where the Mir is flying in about 850 nautical miles behind us. Lucifer, son of the morning, I'm gonna chase you out of earth. Lucifer, Lucifer.